So next up, we've got another friend of ours up here that I have uh, the pleasure of introducing. Waz is going to be speaking. And she's got a wonderful talk on You Are Only Human, so please welcome her to the Tour Camp stage. I, uh, I am hot now. Okay, so... <laughs> Oh, Mike's. Okay. <clears throat> All right. My talk is called uh, You Are Only Human. And if you're interested in it, uh, my particulars are down here at the bottom. Uh, I'm a Boston electrical engineer. Uh, and I will actually get into why I'm giving this talk in the talk. So I'm just going to jump into it and start presenter mode because I've got 58 slides to get through. So we're going to go pretty fast. Uh, resume. All right. No, how manual clicking next? OK, so uh, I don't know about you, but I've heard this completely made up quote before from my friends. I got into technology because I'd rather solve concrete problems and find real solutions than, uh, than deal with messy things like other people and feelings. Um, I don't know about you, but I told this to myself a lot of times in college that people were hard and technology was easy, and that's why I wanted to be an engineer. And, uh, you know, that's, that's part and parcel with the reality of, of being some of us. Um, you know, but I'm going to summarize something stealing from Bunny's talk yesterday uh, in very clear engineering terms. The software we run is only as good as the hardware we run it on, and we're fundamentally limited by our hardware. Our nature as human beings is something that you're probably interested in understanding because you're human, and you might have been ignoring it up until this point. But if you want to make a solid go of getting through life and social interaction without having a terrible time, it's worth paying attention to who you are, not just who you think you are. So this is where I talk about how we're all existentially alone, because we're individuals living in a collective, but we experience the world in a very singular way. We don't natively have any perspective but our own. We're the only thing that's not in our environment. You know, so we're out there you know, trying to suss out the world and explore it in real time with this bizarre time-lapse superposition of life and trying to build you know, perspective from that. And it's really slow, it's painful, and it's error-prone, which is to say we're all walking along in the dark you know, trying to discover what the world looks like by running into the furniture and wondering why it hurts. Um, I wish I remembered which author said that. It was someone cool like Ursula K. Le Guin or James Tiptree Jr. You know, or maybe even um, Louise McMaster Beold, but like it was someone who was insightful about the human condition, because this is the human condition. Um, and uh, and if you're lucky, you might only get to know yourself. You're not really going to ever know the whole world. You're not really going to ever know anybody else. It's pretty fucking existential. And even knowing yourself isn't straightforward. We've got um, this entire self-help pop sci culture for a reason. You know, like, I am ENTJ, destroyer of worlds. Like, there's an entire, like, literature section in the bookstore and five sites on BuzzFeed dedicated to giving you quick fixes and, and quizzes to tell you who you are. And, you know, this, they tell you this because you want to be able to know yourself so that you can do things like figure out what you want, get out of your own way, realize your own potential, make a million dollars, have a bigger penis, like, whatever it is, but, like, you're focused on improving your element of the human condition. And these are things that a lot of people spend a lot of time and money trying to figure out. And some, some people never figure it out. They're always frustrated. But just like you can learn the skills and tools of hardware design and then like create this uh, pattern where you make an investment, it sucks a lot, it hurts to learn, but then you can fix something that's broken, use that to design and analyze something else, use that to build a new thing, break that, and then like go through this virtual cycle of leveling up interpersonal skills and trying to understand who you are and the people around you has the exact same governing principles. And if you make a little bit of an investment in understanding yourself and understanding others, you can open up a whole world of possibilities that you don't know exist because you can marry your perspective to the person next to you and the person next to them. And that's what teams are and that's what society is. And that's what value systems are. So, um, being socially elite unlocks the following in-game features, and I don't have notes, so I have to read it off of here. Social interaction will become less perplexing, and you'll have lower social anxiety and anxiety in general. Um, it will also be a plus 10 to social engineering, because it's actually really easy to ask people for things. Talk to Amanda Palmer. Um, it also increases really ephemeral specs, like fun and satisfaction, and improves how you feel, even though you're not more hardcore. Um, you help, uh, it helps you accomplish goals with less angst. Things just feel easier, right? Like, 
there's all of these things about effectiveness and productivity, reducing self-criticism, reducing jealousy, being a better person, eating vegan, eating more kale. You know, but at the end of the day, you know, it even, it even does, in fact, reduce inflammation and illness because you are made of meat. And uh, it helps you leverage all of the people around you to have a better life. Doesn't that sound really, really hardcore? Because it's really, really hard. So uh, why bother being a more fully human when being a robot is your current safe operating default? And uh, because negative, you are still a meat popsicle. Being stressed as an organism, in, as an organism with cog you know, cognition and, and mind, is really the difference between where you have expectations of what you think is going on and reality. Whereas you all here are problem solvers, if you have an accurate view of what's really going on in your life, you're going to problem solve it. You're going to troubleshoot it. You're going to change the parameters and you're going to fuck with it, to tweak it, to make it better. But you can't do that if you don't have an accurate perspective. So why am I giving this talk? Okay, so this is a uh, social primate 101. Um, you're only going to trust me if I'm actually being genuine. So I'm gonna flip to the notes that I didn't put in the speaker talk. And uh, yeah, they're right here. So I'm giving this talk because once upon a time, I, uh, I fucked up. And so this is radical vulnerability story time. About seven, eight years ago, I had a dream job at the Wies Institute for, Harvard, um, Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University, where I was an early hire. I was a staff engineer. We didn't have a lab. We had a $150 million budget that got matched. And it involved all of the things I cared about after having burned out in semiconductors on consumer goods, which was an operating mission to help people. And I was like, oh my God, this is my moment. I can like work on things to save babies. I can do projects for the ninjas in the meantime. I have a laser cutter. We're gonna build a team. It's gonna be great. And uh, I, I, I cared. I cared so much about my work and I cared way too much. So what happened is uh, I was tasked with building a team. I was tasked with hiring out for other skill sets. And it went fine until I was like, I was like good at finding like, this guy's better at me than firmware, this person's better at mechanical. And then it got to the point where I needed to reproduce myself on the team. I had to hire another engineer who was mixed signal, analog, and I really wanted to work with another woman. And we found one, she really wanted to be on the team, so we hired her. And, uh, and I, was, I was really confused about how other people work, so I assumed she was like me. And I assumed the things that motivated me motivated her. And I assumed that we would like be good friends. And I assumed that we would work well together. And I was completely, completely fucking wrong. You know, so uh, I was ineffective in bringing this person on my team. They ended up hating me. I started getting angry. I started getting more antisocial. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And um, that a friend handed me this book called Dealing with People You Can't Stand, because the way I started this process was I assumed that the woman who joined my team was my work nemesis. I assumed she was lazy. I assumed she didn't care. And I was like, oh, she's terrible. I can't stand her. And in, uh, in page, like, and the way this book starts out is it gives you a whole list of the 10 archetypes of people you can't stand in the workplace. Whether it's the person who's belligerently throwing their weight around, the person who's passive aggressive, the person who avoids work, the yes man, whatever, you get through it and you're like, yeah, I know that guy, I work with him, he's a dick. Yeah, I know that person, oh, they make me so mad. And then in uh, like page 10, they go, okay, so uh, which archetypes are you being in this relationship? Because it takes two to fight and you're part of the problem. If you hate someone this much that you can't stand them, you're being a dick too. And uh, so the rest of this slide, because I done fucked up, and I made my team DOA, and I destroyed this work relationship, and admittedly, the technology got out. You know, we deployed it in NICUs, you know, the, the data collection went well. By arguably, by all means, it was a success. It was like a Pyrrhic victory. It hurt too much to do, and I'm like, man, if I don't fix this interpersonal thing, I'm not gonna build cool things, because I'm a limited capacity unit, right? So I realized that I had to grow TM um, and become a better person to do better next time. So uh, art and technology actually have a huge intersection already, and they have excellent metaphors for understanding the human condition. I started off by listening to a couple Smith albums and realized I wasn't alone. I, uh, I, I tried to console myself by validating my feelings about how much the situation sucked, because it did. And, um, you know, but I'm like, you know what, I've been, through, I've been through really crappy situations before. I got through undergrad at MIT, which is mainly like demoralizing, you know, but it taught me how to build things. My manager consoled me by telling me most people when confronted 
with an opportunity for growth because they are screwing up, choose instead not to grow and to move on to a different situation with a new set of people where they play out the same routines because growing is scary and hard and most people aren't up for doing it. You know, and, uh, and then the next thing I did was I told myself you have to break something in order to extend it. And I was clearly broken and I needed to figure myself out so that I could get out of my own way. So rather than being really willful and stubbornly insisting I was right and this woman was wrong and that guy was wrong and this person was wrong, I, uh, I sucked it up and I wholeheartedly accepted that I was wrong, even though it hurt a lot to do that. And then I realized I didn't still didn't ma magically know, like accepting that you suck doesn't teach you anything new. You're like, man, I'm really bad at shell scripting. It doesn't, like wanting it doesn't make you better at it. Um, and so since my goal was really ultimately to make cool things with teams to help people, here's what I dove into. So what does it mean to be human? And basically, uh, we all have this thing called theory of mind. And theory of mind kicks in between like around one to two years old, and it's the developmental state for your hardware, at which point you realize that everybody else in the world is not an NPC and a figment of your subconscious. Like there's actually a point where very, um, with the way we run is we're so self-referential that it is a developmental stage to realize other people are human and that you are just a small part of a large space. Um, if you go into philosophy, it covers a lot of this as well. There's this thing called the mind-body problem where Descartes tried to argue that we're a consciousness and the body doesn't matter. And, oh, Descartes is so silly. That's bullshit. You know, we're a whole, complete organism. And, uh, and you've got to treat yourself as an organism and not a crystalline entity or a brain in a jar. So how do we process the world? And in machine learning terms, because we're very good learning machines, we're basically a conscious process that's constantly weighting our experiences. And those experiences are intrinsic and extrinsic. It's extrinsic being other people, what's going on with the weather, and intrinsic being things like, I really wonder if I should have drank a liter of water before I got on stage because I'm worried I have to pee, right? So <laughs> these things, there's also things like vulnerability factors, which is extra load on your system, extra things you're dealing with. And these things form like a shield around your self-identity. You know, and a lot of the cognitive shortcuts and sort of things associated with your belief system and your personality that you keep with you in your backpack, up in front of your face like a HUD, you know, as you navigate through life. And these weights are approximations we make that also affect how we interact with everyone else because everyone else has their own story and their own training matrix. And everyone forms things like judgments, biases, cognitive distortions, things that they believe to be true that might be completely different from what you believe to be true, even though you're both operating in a very similar environment. Because like I said, we're all alone in this environment and everyone's got a different path they're walking. <clears throat> so another step is the fact that we're social primates. So this is some pretty um, recent research. I really like uh, Sarah, Pes uh, Sarah Perry's summary essay on this, um, which is linked down here, but it's, Others in mind, social origins of self-consciousness. And I've mentioned before that you don't really know who you are, right? Because like you're a single point of reference and you're not in your environment. And that's because cognitively, as social primates, we get to know ourselves through the eyes of the people around us. So there's this like interesting recursive process that happens. Like I know sometimes that I feel really goofy, silly, and anxious. And then Fabienne's like, no, Waz, you're cool. And I can tell that she means it. So in my viewpoint, I'm like, oh, and then I see myself reflected in Fabienne's viewpoint that she gives me honestly. No, you're doing fine. And I'm like, oh, okay. So now I have this mental model of myself in Fabienne, and I have this model of Fabienne, and I've got the little me inside Fabienne, and that's one view of me that she gives back to me. And then I've got another one from Deviant, and I've got another one from Redbeard. And this is why people say you should choose your friends, because if the people who around you are reflecting really distorted or completely wrong or manipulative images of you, you're going to believe it because this is how we're wired to form social groups. This is how we actually establish the identity of others and ourselves, you know, en masse. That's how our consciousness works. So, uh, lens, so we've got this lens of perception, right? Both internal perception and external perception. We've got this bizarre recursive social model and we've got this tendency to, to be like constantly learning machines. So what does that get us? Oh, it gets us a lot of uh, kind of messed up bugs. So biases 101, meat doesn't follow Moore's law. 
Uh, we, you know, fundamentally are running on a very limited amount of hardware. And so we take computational shortcuts. We're very good at measuring, you know, looking at patterns. So we start with things like perception and experience. And then you have something occur to you repeatedly. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to make an assessment about it. Like, uh, the sky is blue and it's Tuesday. So I'm like, sweet, the sky is blue on Tuesday. I've got an association now. And then you can turn those associations into things like archetypes, so that when I walk up to somebody, I'm like, that person has a utilikilt. I bet they also have a Leatherman, right? <laughs> and then, uh, then you get into things like judgments, or that person drives a Tesla. I think I'm going to reserve judgment for now. Or, uh, <laughs> you know, and then, and then in addition to meat doesn't follow Moore's law, you've got a limited amount of cash, so there's a phenomenon called the monkey sphere, and I apologize, I forgot to link it. But there's actually like a limited amount of processing power you have to view other people as people so that you're interacting with them in this sort of green zone, it's sort of like I take you as you come and it's like new every time. You rapidly jump to archetypes and judgments and then biases, logical fallacies, cognitive distortions and shortcuts like racism as soon as there are too many people in the room, right? And so that's how you get like, you know, massive sweeping statements about dirty hippies or hipsters because they ruin everything, right? And, and this is just how we work, right? You can get to know someone who's different from you, but this is computationally intensive and this is almost computationally free, which is why we do it, which is why it's hard, which is why actually having a f Jaren, fair and just society is constant vigilance, right? Absolutely constant vigilance. My diaphragm shakes when I have to try to talk quiet, so I'm going to move the mic back and yell. <laughs> All right, so cognitive biases. I'm going to give an example of this stuff. Cognitive biases. Go up to Wikipedia, because cognitive biases, you actually can categorize them the way you can categorize things like stack overflows, because you can stack overflow people. So, you know, they're organized into categories based on things like too much information, right? You just gave me too many words to know. Not enough meaning, so I'm going to jump to a conclusion. Um, the need to act quickly, put pressure on somebody like a used car salesman and see what you can get away with. You know, and the limits of memory, give them too many things to remember and eventually they'll just dump core and go into a random state, right? And you know this because you've done it and you usually feel pretty bad when you realize that's happened to you. All right, then there's also logical fallacies. By the way, you can download this poster for free or order Thou Shalt Not Commit Logical Fallacies from yourlogicalfallacies.org. These are things like, um, if you've argued on the internet, you know what these mean. Um, but there are, there are fundamental flaws in reasoning. And when you think about it, these fallacies are repeated throughout cultures. They're repeated throughout generations. You can see them in older writings, right? They're repeated constantly. They're part of the human condition. They indicate some of our shortcuts that we take cognitively as we participate in society. And then we've got cognitive distortions. Um, and if you know what these are, I hope you're getting help to work on them because they're exaggerated or irrational thoughts that you just fall into. And every single person does this. This is not the purview of mental health. Every human has cognitive distortions. I had a friend where he, um, he was telling me a story about how his parents took him uh, snowboarding as a kid or skiing. And he was giving a friend fashion advice for snowboarding as an adult. And she was picking out some garish jacket. And he's like, you can't, uh, you can't buy that. You, you can't wear that. Moguls don't like bright colors. And then he heard himself and he's like, oh shit, right? Because his parents just didn't want him wearing like neon yellow on the slopes, but he actually integrated that, right? And it was real to him as a 35 year old, right? So, and we all do things like selective abstraction. We take the wrong lesson out. We make things our fault. We overpersonalize. we overgeneralize. And these are actually distorted cognitive processes. These are shortcuts you've, and ruts you've gotten into. And uh, in the context of tech, because I do want to make this about tech, um, check out this paper because bias is why QAQC is completely separate from dev and product dev and DevOps, right? This is why engineers aren't allowed to test their own things. Um, bias is why the FDA publishes guidances on user interactions and structures things about, um, you know, adverse event reporting. Bias is why the FDA has created this really interesting um, event reporting system because they realize that pilots won't report when they mess up if there is a penalty, so they have a double blind reporting system so that they can keep track of faults while not, you know, discouraging people from reporting. Because bias and all of these cognitive shortcuts literally kill people all the time, especially when you don't mean to. This is how humans make mistakes and either advertently or inadvertently hurt other people. So check out You Are Not the User, The False, Consequence of, False Consensus Effect. It's a really good paper for why this applies to tech. It'll be a good introductory into the topic. 
And then I mentioned things like vulnerability factors, like how much water I had to drink. These things all predispose you to, being, um, to making these cognitive mistakes, right? Like if you have low-grade pain, it's, it's the same thing as the spoons metaphor. You only have so many spoons to get through your day. That actually means that you have a finite amount of cognitive uh, resources allocated per waking cycle, um, or less if you sleep terribly because we're made of meat. And uh, you go through that executive function you know, throughout the day. You can only make so many decisions. Decision fatigue is real. And these things will actively make your error rate go up. And you know, part of how that works is uh, these things elevate cortisol and adrenaline. And those uh, neurotransmitters reinforce this shortcutting process. It's supposed to be the very fast reaction that keeps you safe from a lion. So there's a PTSD talk coming up. Um, if you want to know more about the body effects of you know, stress, go to that talk. It's also good to check out And the Body Keeps the Score. So I'm going to go through a quick example, because I uh, don't want to run out of time, but I think I'm doing OK, on judgment and bias. So check this out. Legal first is Audi driver who deliberately slammed brakes in road rage is convicted. So uh, let's go through the order of operations of how this works. Because I don't know about you, but I think all Audi drivers are assholes. <laughs> and this confirms that bias. So I'm like, ah, oh, finally, justice. So what happens is there's usually an established pattern. And you can't necessarily control what takes a certain input stimulus and makes a pattern for you. Sometimes it's conscious. Sometimes it's unconscious, right? Sometimes it happened when you were a kid. Sometimes it's something you borrow from your friends, like hardcore people have to drink Red Bull and stay up till 5 AM every day. Um, and then, but you establish a pattern, and then that repeats, and you create a judgment. And then what happens is you react based on that judgment, because it's a shortcut for when you're in a stressed situation. So say, and I'm like driving along. I'm super late to work. I'm super stressed. An Audi driver cuts me off. I spill my coffee on my lap, and I'm like, oh, mother, oh, oh, right? And then I'm like, oh, that asshole, right? But it's about that person. But then it happens again the next week, and this time, like, I dump my papers all over because I was, like, trying to put something back in my bag, and then I'm super flustered when I get into work. Now I've reinforced that judgment, right? Like, I'm like, oh, these Audi drivers, I'm going to get them. And then, um, then I create a self-fulfilling event. I start cutting off Audi drivers on the street. I'm like, haha, I drive a fast car, too. I'm going to get you. Or I drive a Honda Civic. Try me, bro, right? So... <laughs> And that behavior, that behavior then leads to reinforcing these you know, bad interactions. So now I'm engaging in confirmation bias. And it's not just confirmation bias. I am creating a self-fulfilling prophecy where I set up these situations where Audi drivers are dicks to, dicks to me, and I don't know why, right? I'm like, oh my god, they're all terrible. And then you know, basically, I'm perpetuating this terrible vicious cycle while thinking it's completely justified. And then you uh, jump EAX. You just keep doing this until you suck well. You know. So <laughs> when you think about it, people are interacting with one another at a level that's far removed from your individual self, right? So like, uh, do you think anyone here cried this morning? What did, you, uh, what did you eat on the way in? Do you know if anyone else is drinking a beer right now? Do you know how other people feel around you? You, you probably don't, right? You're like, oh, everyone's probably doing this thing because that's what my model tells me. Yeah, you're interacting with the projection you made of them. You know, and maybe they're projecting something to you, like, man, I hope I'm cool enough to be at tour camp. <laughs> oh, God, I'm so nervous. This is my first time. This is not my first time. But, like, I was nervous the first time I came. And, uh, you know, when I tried to be too cool for school, that created a very different experience than when I was honest about being nervous. You know, because the real us, we keep it on the inside. We keep it secret. We keep it safe. Um, and, uh, you know, and that means that we're not really interacting with each other which means we are creating sort of all of these judgments and assessments based on really shitty data because it's cognitively convenient to do that. You kind of have social rules of things like, if I've got enough rules, then I will know exactly what I need to do socially. Okay, so these people need to do this thing on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, the bank teller has to smile at me, right? We have social rules that are meant to sort of offload some of this work, you know, in common value systems. But you know those things are just meant to get people to do stuff together. It's not meant to get you to be happy, healthy, less alone, right? You know, so we've got this catch-22 situation where we can perceive the projection of ourselves through how other people treat us. If they're being honest, sometimes people are assholes and they lie to you about who you are. And we can see other people through this lens of our own lived experience that includes all of these glitchy shortcuts, like did I eat breakfast? And was someone mean to me on the train? You know, and uh, you know, through all of these distortions and biases and distorted self-beliefs, right? 
And, uh, and that's like having a two-bit multimeter as your only piece of test equipment that you can use to explore the world, but the world is all 16-bit color, right? And if you want your, your experience and the things you build in this world to be based in reality, you're going to have to take a lot of measurements, you're going to have to time average them, and it's going to be hell to debug, right? Because that's, that's, we are single points in time moving along together. Existentialism, 101. So, uh, and that's the end of the introduction. So I'm at 24 minutes, <laughs> 24 minutes, and, uh, and I forget what I have next, but we're going to discover it together. So the rest of this talk is focused on the how and why you might be interested in doing the following with a couple of tips. Like this is actually a whole, whole large discipline, like I mentioned, of introspection and meditation and going to therapy and doing what people call the work, right? Like this is why people go to Al-Anon. This is why people go to Alcoholics Anonymous. This is why people join groups. This is why people do Toastmasters. People come to conferences, right, to try things out with their friends in a safe environment. This is society. This is a lifelong problem. But maybe, you know, you want to know a little bit now about what it's like to dismantle sort of this um, lens of perception into a more accurate heads-up display that allows you to separate out things that are about other people, things that are about them, from things that are about you. Um, because then you can start to say, okay, you know what? I think this is because I need to have a smoothie right now and a five-minute break, and when I do that, I'm actually going to be able to solve this problem. And you want to be able to separate out this is about me from this is about them, in part so you can understand the difference between yourself and your projection. Right? Like, it took me a long time to realize that the way I got through college was by establishing a persona that I called Waz, where everyone's like, Waz could do it. Oh, you need something done? She's got it done for you. And I was actually, like, sitting there on the inside being like, oh, my God, when are people going to start helping me do things? Oh, I'm really tired. Right? You see this with, like, every harried mother who's constantly, you know, managing the entire family. And then she just wants her husband to volunteer to do something or her partner, right? Like the domestic partner is doing all of this work. They just want the other person to step in and help them with the work. And then the other person says, well, you should have asked me to do it. You know, not realizing how much pressure the, the domestic partner is on, right? And, um, and, and you might not realize that you're kind of setting the relationship up to be that way, right? Because of your projection and your thing is like, oh, man, I got I to gotta get everything done. I got to be the perfect parent. Right? Or I've got to be the perfect provider. Or I've got to be the perfect hacker. Or I've got to be the most lead. Right? And, um, and then you also want to understand the difference between other people's projections and themselves. Which isn't to say you should go around psychoanalyzing everybody you meet and being like, hey, I have your number. I bet your mom was a very nice lady. Right? So, <laughs> but um, but you, do want to, you do want to acknowledge that everyone else is sort of projecting because they've got their own thing going on. Because you might want to get to know them for real. Because then you'll have a friend. Right? And someone you can trust. So I'm going to say a couple of things with conviction that you probably won't agree with and uh, you probably wouldn't say on your own. Or maybe you really do believe these things. Um, these state of beliefs may drive you to react. Um, and I'll get into a little bit about that later. I'm just going to pick some at, uh, at uh, random. Like normal people aren't as smart as hackers. Or uh, real hackers don't waste their time on self-care because, you know, that's not productive time. You could be writing code. Computers do exactly what you tell them to. Uh, my code is self-documenting. And uh, you know, the work is the only thing that matters. And your hard work will be rewarded if it's good enough, because this is a genuine meritocracy. And uh, things like, you know what, we're all hackers, we're technologists, we're very rational. And uh, everyone should learn Linux. <laughs> and the person uh, who wrote my code base before me was an idiot. There's only one way to do this, and I can't believe they did it the stupid way. I'm going to have to rip this up and start over for it to be worth anything. Now, if you, if you agreed with something, I'm not going to be able to demonstrate this point, but if you're like, uh, really? Or if you're like, oh, hell no, right? Then you're experiencing something called cognitive dissonance that drives you to sort of figure out where you stand in relation to this. Um, and that cognitive dissonance is a result of your lived experience, right? And again, if you've argued with people on the internet and someone is actually saying what they believe and you think they're just trolling, but they are being sincere, you will have, you know, appreciation for how different people's viewpoints are, even though they're all moving through the same meat space. So we're going to take uh, 30 seconds to mentally rewrite some of those statements, just in your own head, to remove judgment and reduce it to an actual fact. Like, I'm going to pick, oh, I didn't say this one. I'm going to pick one I've heard where women aren't good enough to do tech. And so that one's going to take a lot of rewriting. I'm going to say, 
women were some of the earliest technologists back when it wasn't considered uh, socially desirable to do that sort of work. But tech can be hard, but women are people too, and we all have the same basic processing capability. And there is a lot of bias to deal with to, uh, to, to get to other people understanding that, right? Because when we uh, state these things that we believe to be true, a lot of times they're judgments and they're not facts. So step one in like understanding what you've got going on in your heads up display that's sort of distorting your view of the world is talking to yourself and seeing what sort of things you say and looking at what you write and looking at what you tweet and looking at why you tweet it and then say, holy shit, okay, hold on. Can I rephrase this in the form of Fred Rogers, right? Kindergarten rules, kindergarten rules. What if I, for a day, had to go through and talk to people like I was Mr. Rogers, right? There's a really cool paper um, called Fredish, the special language Mr. Rogers used with children because he actually knew how children hear things literally and he wanted to make sure that no one got left behind. And he applied, so he basically he had like a model of how children view the world. He had a model of their lens of perception. And he did a pre-transformation for everything he said and did on that show to make sure that it focused what he said in a way that they could get it, right? He wanted to pitch it to them. He didn't care about adults. He wanted to make sure that any child hearing what he had to say felt heard and seen and important and that they got the message. Right? So we did a pre-translation. That's a huge amount of emotional labor. And you can do that for yourself to figure out when you're sort of saying crappy things, either to yourself like, oh my god, I'm so stupid, I can't believe I procrastinated, I'm an idiot. Right? That's not factual. You're probably quite smart. Yes, you did procrastinate, but that's not the whole story. So um, another thing is our states of mind influence how we interpret facts and uh, situations. So. We're all familiar, um, the literature I get this from is mind, mindfulness literature, um, and they like to call this thinking mind, but I prefer to call it rationalizing mind. So that's when you are in an engagement and you're like, I'm being technically correct, which we know is the best form of correctness. You know, and then you've got emotional mind, which is where someone is super amped up and they are not listening and they need to make their point and they need to be heard and like, it's all the feels, right? Um, and the thing to remember about people who are in emotional mind and also you when you're in emotional mind is, no one's going to remember if you were right. They're only going to remember how you made them feel. You know, and uh, we spend 90% of our time as human beings bouncing between these two. You know, we're either being like super like, well, technically, you know, or we're just like, bam, reacting fast, right? And uh, in either one of these states, in both of these states, we're not playing with a full deck. We rely really heavily on bias and judgments, and these states force us you know, to pick those really quickly, whether it's like a preconceived notion or it's just a knee-jerk reaction. Those are being driven by rationalizing and emotional reactions. Um, and uh, you know, in both of these states, if you need to handle something complicated, you're probably not gonna do an optimal job of it, right? Because you're not playing with a full deck. Like you're, you're already relying on every shortcut you have. It's like the CPU load is super high because someone's you know, doing stuff in the background and maybe they installed malware on your computer, except it's native, because maybe you're a Samsung phone. Um, so <laughs> you know, one of the important things to do is to try to figure out how to find the middle space, which in mindfulness they refer to as wise mind or wisdom, where you're pulling information from both, but you're not being driven by either these very intellectual or very emotional reactions, because then you have options. Then you like, then it's like you just unlocked a new portion of the map, right? And you can go exploring in it and make better decisions. Um, yeah, so here's the, here's the chart of the distribution of probability of time you spend here. Very, very small probability you are being wise without trying really hard. And a good way to identify where you're at right now is sort of like look at your thoughts and see what they're like. Are you cool? Is everything slow? Are you rational? Are you task focused? Are you surgical? Do you have a plan? Are 15 people gonna march in line for your plan? You might be rationalizing. You're ruled by logic and pragmatics. Uh, and otherwise, if you're an emotional mind, you might just feel super urgent. You're like, this shit's gotta get done now, right? And, um, <laughs> and it's a very intense experience, you know, and you might have a lot of feelings come up during it. Um, and I'm not wanna, I don't wanna say that these states are bad, right? And that you should feel bad if you're doing one or the other. They both have information, and that's the point. They both have a lot of information. We are social organisms. Your feelings give you a lot of information. Like, you can have a hunch that tells you, well, oh, that person, I don't wanna be standing next to them because they're just, there's something about it, you don't understand why, but you're like, I don't feel safe there. Or 
you know what, that doesn't look right. Or hey, you know what, there's something wrong with that, 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 that packet value. I, I'll know what it is in a minute. These things are giving you tons of information sort of below the radar. Um, and you want to combine that information to have a very sort of accurate reference point for this moment, right? Like, I'm surrounded by my friends, and this is really awesome, and I'm really happy to be here, even though I'm nervous, right? That's the reality. Um, and, uh, you know, so when Buddhists talk about letting go of attachment, they talk about letting go of all of the things that you sort of assume to be true when you're in one state or the other, where you're like, no, I'm in this state, and I've got to stay in this state. Like, you can invert this to have, like, sort of a well of activation energy. If you're super emotional, it's hard to calm down. And if you're super rational, it's hard to listen to other people, right? And it takes a lot of energy to say, I'm going to try to sit above this and be as fair as I can, even though this feels terrible and it's exhausting, right? Like, if you're being the good parent, as opposed to the parent who's like, oh, I quit. The kid's are yours. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's attachment, to be one way or another, to be like, this has to be the way, as opposed to saying, I can have more perspective. So when Buddhists talk about letting go of attachment, they don't mean that you shouldn't care, and you shouldn't feel, and you shouldn't think, and you shouldn't have a belief. They mean that you should just be aware of where you're coming from and aware of your own state of mind, be able to see and identify where you're at, be able to see and identify what things are judgments, what things are assumptions, what things are facts, and then like name them and identify them like leaves in a stream so that you can let them go and go think about something else. And the lower is going to come back. There's always going to be more stuff flowing past. But when you let them go, that's when you can problem solve. So this is like the sort of introspective equivalent of going for a walk because you need to figure out how to solve a problem. You're giving yourself a break and you're moving past what you're focused on. You're saying, I'm going to let go of the focus. I'm going to walk away from the terminal. I'm going to go to the vending machine. I'm going to solder some stuff. I'm going to play some video games. And then I'm going to come back because you're trying to let go of the problem so that you can come back to it and solve it. right? Because uh, if you were to stay in front of your terminal and not get that perspective, you would just repeat the same mistake over and over and over and over and over again. So the parable of the two Buddhist monks demonstrates this. Uh, does anyone know this one? Yay! OK, so the parable of the monks are an older monk and a younger monk are walking down the road. And they hear uh, a ruckus and screaming. So they run out um, to where they hear it from. And there's a woman drowning in the lake. And the younger monk is like, I don't know what to do. And so the older monk jumps into the water, grabs the woman, pulls her out of the lake. She's super sodden. and he really has to like drag her up onto the beach. Then he has to turn her over, knock the water out of her lungs, give her CPR, and then he sits with her for an hour to make sure that she's okay before he moves on. The younger monk doesn't do anything during this time. So then they pick up, they get their stuff, they keep going down the road. And about five hours later, the younger monk finally speaks, and he says, hmm, brother, I, uh, I, have, uh, I have some concerns. And the older monk is, oh, you know, tell, me, tell me about your concerns. And the younger one says, you touched that woman back there, and you know we're not supposed to touch women. And the first, one's th the first one, the older one, says, hmm, I see. Well, I may have touched her body, but you've been the one carrying her with us for the past five hours. Or we can have the parable of Allison Mallory and the new QC system. So, <laughs> so, uh, so basically, um, Alice and Mallory work on the same team, and Alice has just been promoted to uh, team lead. And she's like, you know what? We really need to do better. We need to implement unit tests. We need to implement code coverage. We're going to have a QC system. You're going to QC your stuff. It's going to get QC to test it before it gets deployed to production. And this is how we're going to improve productivity. I've got it all figured out. And she like drops the docs on everybody. She gives like one or two training presentations. And then she's like, OK, everybody go. And Mallory you know, rolls into work and keeps on, uh, keeps on breaking the production build. She doesn't really know how to run the test. She doesn't. You know, she just keeps on doing things the old way. And Alice gets, like, really irate and just, like, keeps, keeps working on the system, being like, Valerie, you've got to do a better job. You know, and brings her in for some pretty tense one-on-ones where she's like, why aren't you doing this? And Mallory's like, I don't want to talk about it. Like, you know, this is really, you know, this is just difficult. And then Mallory starts talking at the water cooler. Man, this really sucks. This, like, process isn't really good. You know, I don't know what I'm, like, I want to do it the right way, but, like, you know, Alice doesn't know what she's doing, and it's like super tense, and like, why did everything change when she got promoted? All this really sucks. You know, and before long, you've got a classic uh, management setup to fail scenario. Alice puts Mallory on a performance improvement plan, and Mallory quits. And, uh, you know, do we know what happened there? Do, 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 do you have some ideas? 
because we actually don't know at all what happened there. But if you have ideas and you have strong opinions and those opinions are already forming, that tells you a lot about yourself. So we don't know what happened with Alice. Maybe Alice wasn't good at talking to people. Maybe her presentations weren't clear. Maybe her process was convoluted. Maybe it made sense to her and not nobody else. Maybe Mallory didn't care, right? And was just dragging her feet. Or maybe Mallory cared but couldn't do it. We don't know, right? Like, cause, like, no, like the, the scenario doesn't include all of those sort of internal details because we don't have those about other people. But if you find yourself like making assumptions about someone else's intentions without information, those, that data is about you. It's not about them. So that's one way to separate out, is this me or is it them? Because if you can get that information on nothing, it's about you. So related, let's, uh, let's practice what noting is like. So this is called the 478 or relaxing breathing exercise. It's a very yoga thing to do. And it's basically really simple. We're gonna breathe in for four seconds, hold it for seven, and then breathe out for eight. So breathe in, hold it. Breathe out. Now do it again, breathe in, hold it. Now breathe out. Keep breathing while I'm talking. So I want you to uh, exhale completely through your mouth and uh, for the fun of it, do make a whoosh sound. So we're gonna take a few seconds to stop and note. And so while you're breathing in and breathing out slowly, I want you to try to observe how you feel. Do you have any particular sensation in your body right now? Are you experiencing any particular emotions that you can identify? Keep breathing and try to name those emotions. If the emotion comes with a physical sensation, try to describe it to yourself. Maybe your hands are tingly. Maybe your fingers feel cold or you have tension in your shoulders. Keep breathing and see if the emotion has any reaction or action urge that comes with it. Do you know what that urge is? Can you name it or is it not particularly specific? As you keep breathing, do you have any idea of where that urge might be coming from? And can you just name that without judging it? And then move on to the next feeling to see that come through. Can you describe for yourself the way the air feels right now? And then note any sounds either inside or outside the dome. Breathe in and breathe out. And when you feel ready, come back to the room. So that's a, that's a breathing and noting exercise. And the things you know, they're just your thoughts and feelings. They're not who you are, you know, that's not, dictating where you're coming from or where you're going today. It's just stuff you're carrying around in your backpack because we're magpies and we pick up shiny and painful feelings and we put them in our backpack and keep them with us for all time. Because your objective in being an effective person is trying to get to the zone of awesome where you've got your side, their side, and the truth. And like I mentioned um, earlier, one of the things that forced me to actually look at myself and improving myself so I could be less of a dick to the people around me because I was being super perfectionistic and driving myself really hard and that made me drive other people's really hard and made it not fun to work with me on a team because I was taking everything too seriously because oh my God, I wanted to save babies, right? But that's not an effective way to save babies if people are constantly saying like, screw you, I don't wanna work on your project, is, uh, is, is, is it takes two to fight. And then I ran into a person in the grocery line. I learned awesome things from strangers. I, uh, I had one person tell me, don't should all over yourself. Like if you're constantly saying to yourself, oh, I should be doing this and I should be doing that. Like stop and maybe say, what do I wanna be doing? Because right now I'm just goading myself and making myself feel bad. And uh, the person in the grocery line said, you know what, there's always three sides to every story. Your side, their side and the truth. And I'm like, oh my God, this is great. <laughs> Because you really want to get to that like awesome zone of win because that's when you are aligned with the people next to you and you can put your little flashlights, so singular perspective together and map out more of the world. That's effectiveness, that's leverage. 
And, uh, and you know, I don't want you to forget that you're human, right? So this stuff is not easy to do. You are constantly running a huge amount of cognitive tasks. You're doing 15 million things like, you're running biological processes, you might have tissue that's damaged in healing, you've got a lot going on in your emotional life, you've got a lot going on with work, you, there are people you care about and you wonder if you're going to be able to help them, right? Like there's shit in the news. All of these things, uh, you know, put cognitive load on you. So that's why you see President Obama, or former President Obama, make um, shortcuts like he has, or the fly, let's talk about the fly, let's keep it nerdy. His suits are all the same, so he doesn't have to think about it. He's like, mm, optimized, I'm gonna spend that brain power on, you know, doing weird mutant shit. So, <laughs> you know, you, uh, so you're like, okay, so you've given me this thing that scares me about myself and how the F suck do I, you know, get to the real heart of somebody else, given that we're having all of these proxy interactions, right? You just told me that you never really know another person, so it's all done by proxy. Ah, what do I do? And, um, you know, at best, you infer who you are through introspection and try to like shrink the size of your projection down to yourself. And that doesn't mean you have to be yourself with everybody, it means you control when you're projecting something versus when you're not, right? Like if you've gotta have the work persona because you work with a bunch of terrible people, okay, but maybe you don't wanna wear that at home. And um, you know, and then similarly, uh, you try to make accurate observations about other people keeping in mind that your lens is distorted. So like, sometimes that means calling it and saying, I, I really stubbed my toe, I have a twisted ankle, I am going to do fuck all that is productive with interacting with other people, I am going home, I am eating ice cream and I am playing video games, right? Um, you know, so you can, you can learn by noting about yourself, you can try to observe other people, you can practice separating those two things out until you get an accurate picture. And um, this is also probably usually pretty challenging for people in comp sci um, and security based on everybody I know. But practicing compassion is really hard. Um, but practicing compassion to yourself, practicing compassion to others is being effective. If you can't think of anything nice about anybody else, try saying, I'm a good person, I hold the door open for other people sometimes, and I am kind to small animals. Because if those things are true, it creates a little window, right? And if you don't have that window, or you want to know how big your window is, like, do you have a bay window? Do you have, like, floor-to-ceiling windows? Or are you looking out of a periscope? Um, there's this thing called the self-compassion score. It's, like, 20 questions, and it's, you know, actually research-driven and, and therapy-driven. But it gives you questions like, when I'm really into to note on, you know, one to five, things like, when I'm really struggling, I tend to feel like other people must be having an easier time of it or I'm intolerant and impatient towards those aspects of my personality that I don't like, in which case you might be shooting all over yourself all the time and driving up the system load. Or you might actually say a five on, I try to see my failings as part of the human condition. I don't always succeed, but I try. Because <clears throat> if you can't hold yourself in compassion, you know, and go through and actually sort of give yourself the benefit of the doubt, you're only playing with a quarter of a deck. Uh, <laughs> and you're going to have a really hard time giving other people a fair shake. Like, it's not just about damning who you are and taking care of everybody else. You know, you've got to put on your own oxygen mask before you put on somebody else's because it is a reciprocal social relationship, and, you know, everybody needs to be taking care of themselves because just like you can't own other people's stuff, no one else can own yours. Only you can really take care of yourself and then put yourself in a good position to help others or confound others, or smash the competition, or whatever it is you want to do. Like, you don't have to be altruistic to be effective, but you do have to take care of yourself. Uh, and, you know, the self-care, this mining for operational margin, which is, you know, actually way more valuable than Bitcoin, um, is, you know, driven by stuff like, it's hard, it's hard, right? It, it will bring up every insecurity you have. Like, there's this good article here that I like because she actually lists out why it's hard. Like, you take care of yourself and you feel like there's starving children in Africa. Why am I getting a mani-pedi? You know, because mani-pedis aren't self-care, right? Maybe self-care is having breakfast every day. Maybe self-care is taking time to see your friends, right? Um, you know, but it's the only thing that'll take you through. And there's another article I really like because um, I, you know, try to find and identify with other people going through things. And there's an MIT admissions blog um, entry about meltdown where this young woman is basically saying her, she was having a really hard time. She was thinking about dropping out of school and her friend's like, oh, I think I see your problem. You only stay happy 
to the extent that it helps you be a better scientist. And you only take care of yourself to the extent that it helps you be a better scientist. And that's not the right reason to go on living, right? You've got to actually take care of yourself. So I'm going to run through the last slides pretty quickly before I run out of time. But here are the tools you use, right? So you've got tools to debug yourself. You can note and try to be compassionate and non-judgmental when you think about where you're at, where you're coming from, and where you want to go. And you know, admittedly, that process is going to be scary. And you can practice naming those feelings or doing mindfulness practice like the exercise I just walked through. You can talk to a friend about the situation. So in the work situation, I talked to one of my best friends. I tried to outline everything um, you know, really reasonably to her. And her feedback to me was, you are being an asshole. Right? She reflected me back to myself accurately. Right? I was honest with her, and she's like, here's the truth about you. You don't want to see it, but you're being a dick, and you need to go apologize, which I did. It didn't work, but I did it. Um, you know, and if that's too much, you can talk to a therapist. This is their job. Right? If you are working on things like cognitive distortions, then a um, cognitive behavioral therapist can help you with that. Right? If you have distorted thinking from someone who's like just skewed your worldview, and you're like, how do I get to a different worldview given that this is where I'm at? That's what CBT is. Um, if you're working on things like, man, I get angry at the drop of the hat, or I'm just so anxious all the time I can't even think straight, that's um, usually the purview of dialectical behavioral therapy, or DBT, which is usually done in a group setting so that you can kind of role model from all of the people around you, right? And like work on it with a group and a care team. Um, DBT helps people with borderline personality disorder be functional and effective. The founder had borderline personality disorder. But, you know, these things are, you know, good if you have trauma. They're good if you have PTSD. They're good if you don't. They're good if you just grew up lonely or if you just don't know what you want and you need, like, a little bit of help to figure that out so that you can go happily toodling along on your way. Like, there's nothing wrong with getting help to have someone reflect you back to yourself when you don't have a mirror in your apartment, right? And tools to debug others are things like, you know, the same way you set up to solve an engineering problem. Be clear when you go in about what you're trying to do. Just be honest with yourself. Am I going into that office to make a, make a deal and, like, get a new person on my team? You know, do I have a task or a goal in mind? Am I going into that office because I know that I really want that person to work with me and I may not think that they have the right answer, but their relationship is important and I know that someday we're going to do better work together? Or am I going in that office because I need to feel self-respect this person is pushing me around and God damn it, I'm not going to take it anymore, right? What are your goals? If you know those and act in an integrity with them, you'll have an easier time. Whereas like if you say I'm trying to get the task done, but really you just want to pick a fight, you're not going to get the task done and the fight's going to go badly. Then, you know, with other people, you don't want to put all of your stuff on them, right? If you're asking someone for something, project that you're calm, right? Try not to be manipulative. I mean, I know that this would be plus 10 to social engineering, but usually you are effective in social engineering when you take the work off of somebody else, right? So like spend a little time, be confident, be calm, be willing, be open, listen actively. Like you have to learn about other people by kind of situationally observing them in different settings, right? If you're not paying attention, you're not learning anything about them. Then you need to, uh, you know, validate the valid. Like active listening isn't, I know what you're going to say, and then tuning them out. Maybe they'll surprise you. People will surprise you. Um, make space during the interaction for things to happen. Don't script everything in your life because you're convinced it has only one way to go. That's very, very rational, right? But it's also very, very narrow. And um, adjust your tactics, right? Like things are going to change. People are going to throw you for curves. But you're smart, you're flexible, and you can figure it out. But you have to stay, you know, like light on your feet. This is why, like, when you're doing martial arts, you stay centered and calm. Again, wisdom, the best of both worlds, so that you can just sort of move with what you have to do, as opposed to entrenched, rigid, and predetermined. So I saw a pretty cool tweet from a friend that demonstrates this, because you should uh, do some low-stake team-building exercises, like um, try to uh, describe something you want your friend to draw through a wall. Or you can play games, and uh, we'll see. I don't think I have time for this, but... The MIT Mystery Hunt had a challenge two years ago where you had to recite password strings to another player. It's um, at uh, 10 minutes on the Mystery Hunt documentary. I really recommend you watch it because it's hilarious. And it shows you how people interact together and how they build a rapport and a relationship in order to solve this problem with, you know, both people passing the issue back and forth. You know, and uh, 
Again, this is a summary of how much emotional work and emotional labor all of this is. Yes, it is a lot of work. This is why managers get paid what they do, because they do this work for a team. And as you go along one side, it's increasingly more like therapy. Everything from pitching things like Mr. Rogers does to you know sorting out and, and fixing miscommunications by figuring out where each person is coming from, even though they might not know, right? That's management's job. But if your team members do some of this thing like role modeling, right, and setting values and setting clear boundaries and being consistent, then the whole team will work better together. Which is to say, if you're very clear about where you're coming from and why, you'll have an easier time interfacing with other people's APIs. And, uh, you know, again, let go of control. You've got to be vulnerable to build trust. If people don't know who you are, they're not going to trust you, they're not going to listen to you, and you're not going to see the real them. Right? So don't hold the reins of power tightly if you get the chance to work with people. Hold them loosely and give them that open space to trust you and help you in ways you might not expect. Because this can make you a much better developer and technologist. And it's a lifelong practice. And you may not have the skills yet, and you may not know what you want, but you've got like how many decades to work on it if you want to? This stuff can slow you down, but it can't stop you. You're all way too smart for that. And uh, there are worse things to be than human, right? It's actually pretty cool, because then you get a friend. It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. Much worse things to be. Thank you very much.